but the Lord has his timetable. And his purposes know no haste and no delay. But everything is working together toward the coming of Jesus Christ. And he is soon to come. And we can tell by the signs around us. And one of those signs is the Sunday Law movement and how it has been progressing and accelerating in recent years. And so I thought we would review uh, some of the developments in the Sunday Law movement over the last oh, 15, 20 years. So we'll be looking at that this morning. Uh, I went to encyclopedia.com and looked at Sunday closing laws. And it says the first compulsory Sunday observance law in what is now the United States was promulgated in Virginia in 1610. So very early in our history. <clears throat> it made absence from church services punishable by death for the third offense. Yeah. Although there is no record of any person suffering the death penalty, uh, lesser penalties, including whipping, were in effect in all the colonies and were continued after independence. Implicit constitutional recognition of Sunday observance is found in Article 1, Section 7, which exempts Sundays from the 10 days wherein the president is required to exercise his veto of bills adopted by Congress. Uh, this is interesting, though. It's talking about some cases where the laws have been violated. The Supreme Court ruled against those who had appealed their cases for violating the blue laws. And in all the cases, the Supreme Court has ruled against those who have appealed those cases. But in these particular four cases, Chief Justice noted in McGowan, which is the most prominent of them, that numerous federal and state laws affecting public health, safety, conditions of labor, weekend diversion at parks and beaches, and cultural activities of various kind had long been upheld. To forbid a state from prescribing Sunday as a day of rest solely because centuries ago such laws had their genesis in religion would be a constitutional interpretation based on hostility to the public welfare rather than the separation of church and state. The court had more difficulty sustaining laws applied against persons observing a day other than Sunday as their divinely ordained day of rest. Six justices agreed that state legislatures, if they so elected, could constitutionally exempt Sabbatarians from complying with Sunday law restrictions. But the free exercise clause did not mandate that they do so. However, a majority of the court could not agree upon one opinion to that effect. The Chief Justice, speaking for a plurality of four, noted that while the clause secured freedom to hold any belief, it did not forbid regulation of secular practices merely because some persons might suffer economically if they obeyed the dictates of their religion. Income tax laws, for example, did not violate the clause even though they limited the amount of deductions for religious contributions. If a state regulated conduct by a general law, the purpose and effect of which were to advance secular goals, its actions was valid despite its indirect burden on the exercise of religion, unless the purpose could practicably be otherwise accomplished. A Sabbatarian exemption would be hard to enforce and would interfere with the goal of providing a uniform day of rest that, as far as possible, eliminated the atmosphere of commercial activity. The laws thus did not violate the free exercise clause. Okay. So this was in 1961 when these cases were heard. So this is the law of the land, Sunday laws do not violate the Constitution, and you cannot claim uh, First Amendment 
So then I was looking at uh, Spectrum magazine, and they have this article on Adventists in American courts and Sunday law cases where Adventists were thrown in jail. And it says, beginning in the late 1870s, state Sunday laws in the U.S., which had long been unenforced, received renewed attention and execution after failing to get a national Sunday law passed in Congress, the National Reform Association, a coalition of Christian abolitionists, temperance promoters, and morality advocates seeking to prevent further secularization of American society and advance public morality based on Christianity, successfully led a campaign in Pennsylvania in 1879 for the passage of an expanded and strengthened Sunday law. I want you to think about that for a minute. Do we have such uh, a scenario today, yes, where we have different groups with different purposes all coming together, working for common goals, whether it's temperance or whether it's climate change or whether it's morality, Christian morality, all these different groups are all coalescing together, working for common goals, common purposes. So this was happening back in 1879, and um, they got a strengthened Sunday law as well as for the defeat of an exemption clause for Saturday observers. You see, in the original blue law, there was an exemption for Sabbath keepers, but they had it removed when the law was reenacted. Leading the counter campaign against Sunday laws were liberals, including liquor industry reps whose business was significantly impacted by Sunday laws. So that's who we were linked together with. They said, oh, you're with the alcohol group. You're against temperance. And it's interesting, I was reading in uh, The Impending Conflict in the Great Controversy, the chapter Impending Conflict, and it talks about that... Um, at the end time, that temperance movements and other movements will be combined together with the Sunday Law movement to advance the Sunday Law. And that even though the cause of these other movements might be good, we cannot join with them while they are associated and advocating Sunday in violation of God's law. So <clears throat> I thought that was very interesting. There is definitely a parallel to what was happening back then and what is happening today. The two sides clashed in California after uh, Mr. Kozer, a saloon owner, was arrested in November of 1881 for violating California's penal code, which exacted fines to those who opened on Sunday any store, workshop, bar, saloon, banking house, or other place of business for the purpose of transacting business therein. After his arrest, Kozer filed a habeas corpus petition to the Supreme Court of California challenging the legitimacy of the statute under the state constitution. A key argument by Kozer was that the statute represented an impermissible religious regulation. The state's main argument was that the Sunday Law was only a public welfare statute, which the state had the right to enact. In March of 1882, the court, in a 4-3 to three decision, held that the law was constitutional. This legal battle provided the backdrop to Ellen White's son, William W.C. White's, arrest in the same year for violating the same statute by operating the Pacific Press in Oakland, California, on Sundays. In response to prosecutions such as this and the Republican Party's support of the Sunday Law, Adventists in California deserted the GOP in mass and voted for Democrats who fought against Sunday Laws in the state's general election in November of 1882. The Democrats won every major state office in that election, gained control of the state legislature, and repealed the controversial Sunday Statute in 1883. 
interesting little piece of history. Hmm? So I want to go back to this for a minute. William could have paid a fine and stayed out of jail, but he and all the Adventists, and there was well over a hundred that were arrested for violating these laws in half a dozen different states. They all elected to spend time in jail in protest of the laws rather than just pay a fine. Uh, unlike in California, in many southern states, new Sunday laws were enacted and existing Sunday laws strengthened and unwelcome consequences for many Adventists. The first legal opinion involving a Seventh-day Adventist criminalized by a Sunday statute appears to be the Arkansas Supreme Court's decision in the Scholes v. State in 1886. In that case, five Adventists, including James W. Scholes, a minister, were arrested for violating the state's Sunday law in the spring of 1885. Their crime was painting the exterior of the church building on Sunday, May 3rd, 1885. So they were all arrested for that, and uh, the Arkansas state law under which the Adventists were arrested was the revised statutes of 1838, which until 1884 contained the following clause. Persons who are members of any religious society who observe as Sabbath any other day of the week than the Christian Sabbath or Sunday shall not be subject to the penalty of this act, so that they observe one day in seven agreeably to the faith and practice of their church or society. So there was an exemption for Sabbath keepers that was removed in 1884. So eventually, Scholes and two others were tried in the fall of 1885 in the county circuit court. Representing the Adventists was James David Walker. The presiding judge ruled that the law was constitutional because it applied equally to all people without favoring or disfavoring any religions, and no citizen had a right to insist on exercising individual conscience in opposition to the laws of the state. After indicating his ruling and convicting the three defendants, the judge gave Scholes an opportunity to speak. For over 40 minutes, Scholes held court, speaking about the biblical grounds of Adventism's Sabbath observance with the Bible in his hand. The crowd that had gathered from different parts of Washington County sat in perfect silence as Scholes spoke reported one observer. The sentence issued against the Adventists with either fine or jail time. They chose jail to make a public statement, as did Adventists who were prosecuted elsewhere. Concerning King in 1891, Tennessee was another state in which Adventists found themselves prosecuted for Sunday law violations. Several Review and Herald issues in 1886 report on the case involving three Adventists indicted for Sunday labor in Tennessee. Apparently, their case also reached the Supreme Court of their state, but their convictions were summarily affirmed without an opinion. Like Adventists in Arkansas, rather than pay fines, they serve time in jail. Of at least 21 Sunday law prosecution cases in Arkansas alone in the 1880s, almost all of the defendants appear to have been Adventists. Many more Adventists in Tennessee were convicted of Sunday law violations, placed in chain gangs, and subjected to hard labor. One early 20th century author counted over 100 Seventh-day Adventists in the United States and about 30 in foreign countries who were prosecuted for quiet work performed on the first day of the week, resulting in fines and costs amounting to $2,269 and imprisonments totaling 1,438 days and 455 days served in chain gangs. A survey of legal opinions issued since Scholes and King shows that Sunday law prosecutions of Seventh-day Adventists persisted well into the 20th century, despite continuing constitutional objections raised by Adventists. After Scholes and King, at least 12 additional opinions involving Adventists were issued between 1894 and 1963. 
by courts in Illinois, Kansas, Maryland, Missouri, Nebraska, Ohio, Oklahoma, South Carolina, and Washington. So the final word. Uh, we looked at this earlier in 1961. The U.S. Supreme Court issued an opinion that settled the question of the constitutionality of state Sunday laws. The opinion came as part of the decisions made in a cluster of four cases from Maryland, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania. Writing for the majority, Chief Justice Earl Warren acknowledged that Sunday laws in history originated with religious aims, but he insisted that these laws were no longer religious in character. He found contemporary Sunday laws to be completely secular statutes that apply equally to people of all religions only incidentally advancing the aims of certain religions and burdening the practices of others. Thus, these laws did not violate the First Amendment. Chief Justice Warren also held that these laws did not violate the equal protection and due process guarantees of the 14th Amendment because the laws were designed for the purely secular purpose of improving the health, safety, recreation, and general well-being of state residents. He thus concluded the present purpose and effect of most of them is to provide a uniform day of rest for all citizens. The fact that this day is Sunday, a day of particular significance for the dominant Christian sects, does not bar the state from achieving its secular goals. So there you have it. Now this uh, author had some observations, and observation number three was interesting to me. Uh, published in 1884, Ellen White's Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, included a greatly expanded section on 19th century America and the end time. The chapters commenting on the Sunday Law Movement and predicting its future, which did not exist in the book's precursor, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4, were composed as the National Reform Association saw its early successes in pushing for more restrictive state Sunday legislations. So God used this to help Ellen White understand what was coming in the future, and he gave her visions and understanding of what would happen at the end of time uh, as these things were playing out in the 1800s. And as White's own son, W.C. White, and dozens of other Adventists were arrested, fined, and imprisoned for Sunday labor, Ellen White and other authors writing for Adventist publications throughout the 1880s and 1890s saw the Sunday Law Movement as representing the dangerous and precursory apocalyptic core of American Christianity. So these are a few quotes from... The Impending Conflict chapter in the Great Controversy. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. Then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. The class that have provoked the displeasure of heaven will charge all their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual reproof to transgressors. It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath, that this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced, and that those who present the claims of the fourth commandment, thus destroying reverence for Sunday, are troublers of the people, preventing the restoration to divine favor and temporal prosperity. The miracle working power manifested through spiritualism will exert its influence against those who choose to obey God rather than men. 
Communications from the spirits will declare that God has sent them to convince the rejectors of Sunday of their error, affirming that the laws of the land should be obeyed as the law of God. They will lament the great wickedness in the world and second the testimony of religious teachers that the degraded state of morals is caused by the desecration of Sunday. Great will be the indignation excited against all who refuse to accept their testimony. The dignitaries of church and state will unite to bribe, persuade, or compel all classes to honor Sunday. The lack of divine authority will be supplied by oppressive enactments. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure the public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Liberty of conscience, which has cost so great a sacrifice, will no longer be respected. For 140 years, we've been warning people as Seventh-day Adventists that a Sunday law was coming. And for 140 years, people have said, that can't happen. It already happened in the past, uh, and it will happen again in the future. Uh, before I move on to this, we were talking at our Vespers about things that transpired in the late 1800s. So in 1779, in Pennsylvania, this coalition of advocates of different causes get together and they achieve enacting a stronger Sunday law and removing the exemption. So you have to keep Sunday and then you can't keep Sabbath. You see, same thing at the end of time. Okay, so anyway, here we are now. So this is an article in Time Magazine a while back, and uh, CNN, the importance of a stop day, uh, Christian living, not sure which one this is, making Sunday a day of rest, why Sunday should be a day of rest, three easy ways you can keep the Sabbath day holy. Which Sabbath day? Well, Sunday, of course. Sunday laws aren't about Christianity, they're about economics. You see, they've been adopted also by the atheists. Oh yeah, we like Sunday, sure. It's good for the family, it's good for the environment, it's good for children, it's good for all kinds of things. Good for economics. <clears throat> Sunday has lost its sense as a day of rest, renewal in Christ, the Pope says. Well, you remember in his encyclical, the Dado C, in 2015, he said that Sunday was essential for the healing of the planet and the healing of our relationships with one another, that we must reclaim Sunday. And the popes have been saying that for a long time over and over and over again. It's a constant refrain. Well, let's take a look at what's going on in Europe. How Europeans are fighting back against Sunday trading. This is in the Catholic Herald. And of course, who is leading the Europeans to do that? It's the Catholic bishops in Europe. Why the push for European Sunday laws? Groups within Europe are pushing for laws to prevent work on Sundays. Could this seemingly harmless idea have prophetic implications? Mm -hmm. Well, this is one large group in Europe that is pushing for uh, Sunday laws. It's the European Sunday Alliance. And in the United States, we have its sister organization, the Lord's Day Alliance, here in the United States. But there's lots of groups that are all working for this. Uh, so they got this call to action. 
um, for a work-free Sunday on the 3rd of March. Um, so, work-free Sunday for decent working hours in Europe, which way forward? As in 2019, uh, CESI is a, an association of trade unions, and they are for this Sunday um, and pushing for it. So you have the trade unions involved also in the United States and in Europe uh, pushing for Sunday closing laws. Um, European Confederation of Independent Trade Unions is a confederation of 40 trade union organizations from 20 European countries. Pretty big organization. And they're all for Sunday. Uh, European elections. The European Sunday Alliance calls on MEPs to promote a work-free Sunday and decent work in EU legislation. Uni Europa calls on EU to back work-free Sunday. Trade unions. So what's happening with Sunday work in Europe? Uh, Sabbath switch off. Why to reclaim Sunday from the digital domain? EU work life balance directive enters into force. So, the directive, which was passed by the European Parliament in April of 2019, entered into force on the 1st of August in 2019. Member states now have three years to adopt the laws on work-life balance. So three years from 2019, from August, is August 2022, right? So they had three years to adopt these work-life uh, balance directives. Um, and mainly they had to do with leave, family leave. But there's also this aspect to it. Work-life balance, why Sunday is the most important day of the week for your well-being. Oh okay. So you also have Sunday connected to this work-life balance. And <clears throat> you see, they get you to adopt these things incrementally. Not all at once. Okay. So they get you to adopt work-life balance for these family leave directives, but also embodied in it, apparently, is Sunday. Uh, Germany. Now, Germany has a long history of Sunday laws. Uh, why are shops in Germany closed on Sundays, many visitors want to know. German court enforces the day of rest. This is in 2009. Many visitors to Germany can find themselves standing outside a closed department store, perplexed to find they cannot do a bit of shopping during their weekend trip. Well, that's because German shops have been closed since 1956 as a result of their shop closing law. And here it says German is a tool that enforces Sunday for Rome. Thousands of motorbikers protest the proposed Sunday ban in Germany. Not relaxing it, but they're making it more stringent. And so the bikers don't like that. Uh, what about Poland? Well, Poland adopted Sunday laws in 2017. Polish bishops for total ban on Sunday shopping. This was in August of 2017. Poland to reclaim day of rest by phasing out Sunday shopping. The country's Catholic bishops have praised the move, but say it doesn't go far enough. Returning to the Bible, <laughs> Poland reclaims Sunday as a day of rest. 
Poland reclaimed Sunday as a day of rest. Polish lawmakers voted last week to reclaim Sunday as a day of rest by slowly phasing out Sunday shopping by 2020. In 2012, Pope Benedict said that in defending Sunday as a day of rest, one defends human freedom. Polish trade unions argue that Sunday rest assures equal treatment for all employees. Poland's Sunday trading ban takes effect. Catholic Church welcomes law that begins with ban on two Sundays a month, extending to all Sundays in 2020. With this law, we will return to normalcy. Didn't we also hear that in the COVID-19 crisis? The, yes. Yeah. With these mandates, we can return to normalcy. Okay, so anyway, this is, this is about Poland. What about Italy? Okay, are these small countries we're looking at? Don't forget France. Uh, Germany, Poland, Italy. These are large European countries. New Italian government proposes a ban on Sunday shopping. Vatican works to stop Sunday shopping in Italy. And that was 11 years ago, right? 2012. Italy, no more Sunday shopping. Okay. How about Croatia? Um, Catholic Church wants to ban working on Sunday in Croatia. Croatia heading toward work-free Sunday. Croatia. Regulating and restricting Sunday working is also in line with the directive of work-life balance. See? There's a connection. Adopted by the European Parliament last year, which has to be incorporated into the national legislation of EU countries by 2022. So basically, if you adopt these uh, directives, you adopt Sunday. That's, that's what it says here. And all the European countries in the EU had to adopt this and, and write it into their laws by August of 2022, which was just a few months ago. Yeah. Right Croatia's Work-Free Sunday aims to improve emerging Europe's work-life balance. How about Hungary? Hungarian lawmakers ban Sunday shopping to boost family togetherness. So is playing baseball on Sunday working? No, they want you to play baseball. And the Pope wants you to play sports. He says, waste time with your children doing sports and so on and so forth. The churches protest about the rainbow flag and Sunday shopping. Okay. And they unite these things together. They link them together. Okay? When they have social issues, they link them together with Sunday. Yeah. So around the world, we have in Kenya, uh, Naru Darua bans Sundays as market days. Sundays should be dedicated to thanking God and not for trade. Personally, I see it as ungodly for some people to take the advantage of the day not to go to church, but to market. My administration will not encourage this. <laughs> he claimed that this could be one of the reasons why his county was lagging behind in development. India. Second Sunday will be rest day for TV industry. Now, is India prominently Christian? No, Hindu and Buddhist, right? But they make Sunday a rest day for the TV industry, for the Bollywood film industry. They have to take that day off, mandated by the government. Up in Quebec City, in Canada, most Quebec stores will close on Sundays as coronavirus cases mount. Why Sunday? It's a way to fight the pestilences. Close on Sunday. It's going to help. Keep everybody home. One day out of seven, you're going to cut the cases, help the hospitals, all that kind of thing. 
Borneo. Sunday should be made rest day with family, she says. Samoa. Samoa Prime Minister wants to ban Sunday trading. Barbuda. Lower House passes the public holiday amendment bill of 2019. Israel. Israeli proposal to make Sunday day of rest may benefit retail. Israeli's government is examining a proposal to shift the weekend to the Western Saturday Sunday, a step that may benefit financial markets and retail and leisure companies. Israelis push to make Sunday an extra day to rest and play. And at the same time, that they consider adding Sunday as a day of rest, a high court rules Tel Aviv stores can open on Sabbath. So, want to adopt Sunday and relax restrictions on Sabbath. Supermarkets, entertainment centers, and pharmacies will be allowed to operate in Tel Aviv from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset. Pope Francis says, no work Sunday is good, not just for faithful. Good for everybody. Slow Sunday, the simple solution to global warming. Keeping stores open on Sunday is not beneficial for society, says Pope Francis. Break time, reasons for closing on Sunday. Spending Sunday at, in a cinema is not God's way. Protests after Scottish Island shows films for first time during the Sabbath or Sunday. Keeping Sunday special has priceless value. Everyone's right for a day of rest on Sunday. Archdiocese of Malta. Keep car sales closed on Sundays. This guy was a car salesman for 20 years, he says. And I am speaking for all of us in the car business when I say I dread working on Sundays. Hmm. There's a saying in business, he says, if you can't be profitable in six days a week, seven days a week is not the cure. A complete ban on Sunday trading would be better for everyone. Pope Francis urges not working on Sundays. Waste time with your children, he says. Bring back the blue laws. Now, this one was on the Lord's Day Alliance uh, website. It's an article saying that Sunday is a mark of Christian unity. And I thought it was interesting that he used that word. Sunday is as a mark of Christian unity. Religious laws may be coming to America, but it's not Sharia, it's Christian. Which religious group wants to base U.S. laws on its faith? The answer may not surprise you. It's the white evangelicals. Project Blitz, legislative assault by Christian nationalists to reshape America. This Fox News closed on Sunday. And they tweeted, should all stores close on Sunday to allow staff a day off to recuperate? This is a mayor up in Canada, and he says, Once we kick COVID-19, I suggest that everything be closed on Sundays again so that we can appreciate the importance of what taking a pause in our busy lives really means. I think our body, mind, and soul will, would thank us. Imagine if most of the world's monotheists, who, those who come from traditions that profess to observe weekly Sabbath, along with anyone else who cared to, chose for one day out of seven to essentially eliminate their own harm to the environment on a consistent basis. This would prove to be one of the cheapest environmental solutions at humanity's disposal. In theory, more maximal Shabbat observance could produce 14.3 reduction in carbon emissions without additional spending, new technologies, or unintended environmental consequences. One day out of seven where emissions are nearly eliminated, observing a truly full weekly Shabbat Doing nothing, as it were, offers an effective action that one can take now to heal our environment. 
the Sabbath in an era of climate change. A modest proposal for the day of rest. This guy proposes, Dr. Smaja, uh, he calls for 53 Sabbaths a year to be off, all Sundays, plus approximately 15 holidays where cumulatively there would be a cessation of all productive activity for approximately 70 days or about 20% of the year. These days of non-activity would help achieve the shared goal outlined in the Paris Climate Conference. So anyway, to those that say, nah, it could never happen. If you're not looking for it, you won't see it. Because it's not prominent in the news. You have to go look for it. You have to do a little Googling, a little searching. But it's out there. And, and these things are definitely moving the world in the direction of national Sunday laws. And I think a, a great part of the world is already prepared for the national Sunday law in the United States. When that's enacted, all the rest of the countries that have not already adopted Sunday will at that point. So the good news is God's in control. Amen. This is all according to his timetable. What an exciting time to live in at the approach of the second coming of Jesus Christ to see these things develop and to know that we are very soon going to see Jesus, very soon going to see our Lord and Savior when he comes in the cloud of heavens. And uh, I'm looking forward to that day. And we're told to, to watch and pray and work. <laughs> so with that, let's pray.